absolutely quiet. Uh, so that's the first tick. The rupees once again gravitated to the day's low. 17,075 points, half a percent lower on the benchmark indices. Well, it's turning out to be a session where we are seeing some amount of declines, but there's definitely a recovery. We broke just uh, kind of hit just under the 70,000 mark, and now we're about 50 points above that level. Looks like that 17,000 handle is going to hold. Uh, we breached below it. The intraday low on the Nifty was 16,989. So we went below the 17,000 mark, but we're managing to close above it. Hello and welcome to CNBC TV 18. You're watching Markets Today, the show where we track about six hours of the day's trading action in just five headlines. I'm Ikta Batra here are the top stories for the evening. Markets fall for the fourth straight session. The Nifty and the Sensex see cuts of half a percent. BSE companies to raise a market capitalization of over two lakh crore rupees. Banks fare relatively better. Market masters strike a cautious note in their conversations with CNBC TV18. Most advice caution given the current market conditions, but see investment opportunities emerging on a further decline. After recovering for nine straight sessions, Adani Group stocks tumble, wiping out 42,000 crores in investor wealth. Questions are being raised over who owns ACC and Ambuja after the company's disclosure shows Vinod Adani as the ultimate beneficial owner. Sales of big chunks of shares by Blackstone in Sona, BLW and m and in Mahindra CIE draw good responses from foreign and domestic institutional investors, signaling a healthy appetite. Oil prices slip after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank rattled equity markets globally. Metal prices shine, gold, silver and platinum, platinum rise over 5%. Hello and welcome to the show. Well, no respite for the bulls. The markets did fall for the fourth straight session. The Nifty and the Sensex saw cuts of half a percent each. The BSC companies raised a market capitalization of over 2 lakh crore rupees. Banks, however, relatively were better. Prashant is here with the details. Well, we had a, a down day once again. Although, like yesterday, the market did recover quite a bit from the day's low. Uh, first things first, the Nifty did break 17,000 intraday, uh, but then we closed above 60 or 70 points above it, uh, which you know, at the margin is perhaps some relief, but uh, it was still triple-digit losses coming in on the Nifty. The banks, of course, have been the weakest part. Bank Nifty also ending sharply lower. Both the Nifty and the Bank Nifty, of course, yet have already broken their respective February lows, uh, and they've gone even further lower. Banks did, starting at about 11.30-12, see some recovery uh, from their respective lows. So there was that bounce that they closed with. The big sectoral losers, as I said, banks and PSU banks in particular, IT services lost, uh, mid-cap tech especially with regards to fears of exposure to some of these uh, banks in the US, metals and real estate and the other indices which were down as well. After many days of uh, recovery and repair, which we've seen in Adani Group stocks, today it was a down day. So Adani Enterprises, Adani Ports, Adani Power were some of the names there from that pack, from that group, which were sharply lower uh, as, as well. Now, coming to the large cap uh, losses, uh, again, financials formed a large part of it, banks and non-banks. HDFC Life, Kotak Bank, Bajaj Finance were some of the top losers, but there were also names like Mahindra and Mahindra and TCS, which were lower. The gainers today in the form of Titan, BPCL and Bharti, uh, far and few in between. Market breadth was negative. Two is to one, declines to advances. Uh, but I must say that uh, numerically uh, that was the case. But if you go by just volume-led losses or volume-led gainers, it was not looking all that uh, bad. Bandhan was sharply lower, having said that. Indian Bank, Bank of India, PNB Housing, Linde India, Supreme Industries, Keynes Technologies were some of the names which lost in trade. They were gainers as well. Sona comms, uh, you had Gland Pharma, Mahindra CIE, and Sequence Scientific, uh, some of the uh, broader gainers. All in all, a disappointing day for bulls if you're hoping that, uh, if you were hoping that having broken Feb lows, the market uh, uh, halts a little bit, but 17,000, at least on an intraday basis, is also gone. I think it's back to uh, watching the global screen because that is essentially at the margin what is impacting sentiment in a very large way. We also have the US CPI numbers for the month of February later today. And I think that will only add to the mix of information when we come back tomorrow. Back to you.
Okay, all right, Prashant, thanks very much for that. So the intraday low on the Nifty was 16,987, so that probably becomes the near-term support that the street would be watching. But on to the second headline now, market masters strike a cautious note in their conversations with CNBC TV18. Most advice caution given the current market conditions, but see investment opportunities emerging on a further decline. Shankar Sharma of GQuant Investec said that the Indian market was doing better than other countries while Tahir Badshah of Invesco Mutual Fund expects 2023 to be difficult for the Lal Street. We also did speak to Gautam Shah of Goldilocks Premium Research, who expects to see more downside for the markets going forward. Structurally, India is far, far better than most other countries uh, you know, in the world. Ultra-low rates basically propelled money towards the riskiest part of the market, uh, which, is the, which is the VC market. And, you know, that led to all kinds of unmerited businesses burgeoning and people either giving equity or debt also burgeoned alongside and SVB obviously you know for the beneficiary of that boom and suddenly we found that it wasn't so I don't think this is this is a structural problem 2023 at least to me looks to be a difficult year from a market perspective um and therefore to that extent I mean uh, while we are uh, amongst the flows and uh, you know the industry has been once again, uh, seeing some recovery as far as flows is concerned, we are we are moving in reasonably, you know, cautiously. Uh, I don't really see any hurry to get into the market uh, uh, in a big way. I do believe there is more downside. There is some minus support around 17,100. But I think for a very long time, we have been working with a minimum target of about 16,800. So I think we are going to get there. Another big problem was that India... Uh, corrected almost on a standalone basis till a month back you know so we had our own issues to deal with and now with what has happened globally around the svb uh, episode you know things look quite ugly on the global markets as well uh, you know put together us and europe so things don't look good i don't think uh, this is going to resolve in a hurry expect a lot more weakness before things get better Okay, so that's all the market opinion, but how is the Indian tech industry reacting to the Silicon Valley bank crisis? Reema Tendulkar is here with the details. Thank you very much for that. So the street fears that the BFSI revenue, the financial sector revenue for the Indian IT companies will come under pressure. Now remember, US BFSI roughly contributes about 30 to 35 percent of the overall Indian IT companies revenues. And given what we are seeing in the banking space there with SVB collapse, the fears of a contagion, the fear is that this banking revenue uh, will come under pressure. But here we need to differentiate between the large cap US banks like JP Morgan, Wells Fargo and the regional banks. The fear right now, the panic is on the regional bank. What we've learned from analysts is that the large cap Indian IT companies have an exposure to the large cap US banks which are unaffected so far. The mid-cap IT companies may have some exposure to regional bank, which is where there is some amount of uncertainty and question marks. Uh, so now this is an ambit note, and this is where we've picked up the client data of some of the mid-cap IT companies. Now, CoForge has an exposure to Fifth Third Bank. It's one of their large uh, you know, clients, and Fifth Third Bank, remember, is a stock which was under pressure yesterday, down 13 14%. Emphasis has an exposure to First Republic Bank. Uh, so despite all the assurances, First Republic uh, Bank share prices were down 61%. So the street fears that if these regional banks uh, see some pressure, then their revenues, which flow through into Indian IT companies like you know, Emphasis and CoForge, will come under pressure. But even if there is no contagion impact, even if there is no uh, collapse in the other banks beyond what we've seen so far, the worry is that banks are likely to turn cautious. They will go into capital conservation mode. They will hold on to their capital. They may not spend on their tech budgets. The deal ramp-ups may slow down. Uh, the sales conversion cycle will get longer. And therefore, the earnings visibility may get dulled a bit in the near term. Okay, all right, uh, Reema, thanks very much for that. But let's move on. The third headline for this evening, Adani stocks were under pressure today after recovering for nine straight sessions. Investor wealth to the tune of 42,000 crore rupees got wiped out today after all 10 stocks ended in the red. A morning context uh, report published on Monday 13th of March reported that Ambuja Cements and ACC are owned not by the Adani group, but by Vinod Adani controlled entities. CNBC TV 18 has gone over the disclosure made in the open offer document for Ambuja Cement and verified the same. The disclosure reads, and I quote, the ultimate beneficial ownership of the acquirer 
is held by Mr. Vinod Shantilal Adani and Mrs. Ranjan Ben Vinod Adani, end quote. The point of concern on this is that the Adani group had indicated in its response to Hindenburg's allegations that Vinod Adani is not a related party. We await a response from the Adani group for greater clarity on the subject. Well, on to our CNBC TV 18 exclusive then, Bandhan Group is planning to enter the insurance sector. We learn from sources that the group is looking to enter the general insurance business first, followed by life insurance. This comes after the group recently met with officials from the insurance regulator IRDAI expressing their intent. Yash Jain is here with more. Well, that's correct. So, uh, the insurance regulator IRDAI, since a very long time, time and again, has been, uh, you know, saying and talking about more players coming into the insurance space. And what we're given to understand from our sources is that one of those new companies coming into the insurance market could be from the house of Bandhan Group. What we've been given to understand from our sources is that uh, Bandhan Group is planning a foray into the insurance market. This includes both general and life insurance companies. But the first objective will be to look at the general insurance market and then after once that is settled uh, to look at the life insurance market. What we've been given to understand from our sources is that uh, Bandhan Group Management recently met the insurance regulatory body expressing this desire to enter the insurance market and one very important point uh, which sources tell us came out of that conversation was the group is looking at both options that is organic uh, which is uh, through establishing its own company and inorganic which is through the acquisition route. What we've been given to understand is that uh, Bandhan Group is already speaking to a lot of existing general insurance insurance companies to explore the inorganic or the acquisition route as far as entering the insurance market is concerned. At the same time, the group is awaiting uh, the amendments in the insurance space, which is essentially waiting for the parliament approval because that will help the group uh, to commit a lower capital to start a new greenfield uh, a general insurance company. Uh, of course, at this point of time, Bandhan Group is present in the banking space uh, along with it in the mutual fund space and this will be an important addition in the form of insurance. Okay, all right, Yash, thanks very much for that. Well, let's move on. Sources are telling CNBC TV 18 that the Income Tax Department survey at CIPLA is focused on tax avoidance and violations and that the department is investigating wrongful claims under multiple sections of the IT Act. Tim C is here with details. Well, that's right. What sources have told CNBC TV 18 is that the Income Tax Department, which took survey operations at CIPLA on 31st January, have focused on violations and tax avoidance. However, we are given to understand that no tax demand has been raised so far by the IT department, but preliminary investigations are looking for wrongful claims and deductions. Here, under Section 80 IA, investigations allege that CIPLA has made wrongful claims of about 400 crores under this particular section. For the benefit of our viewers, Section 80 IA provides for deduction of 100% of profits and gains derived from specific businesses for 10 consecutive years in a block of 15 years, only up to a certain period. Not just this, IT department alleges 1,300 crore of wrongful deduction claimed for R&D. Section 35 of IT Act actually provides for deduction on expenditure incurred for scientific R&D, ranging from 100 or 150 percent on case-specific basis. Taxman also alleges tax avoidance on funds given as benefits to doctors and medical practitioners, amongst other violations. CIPLA, in its response to CNBC TV 18, shared that there is no claim or demand made on us. CIPLA, in an exchange notification on 6th Feb, had shared that the company has fully cooperated with the IT department in providing details and documents. CIPLA continues to do so on all items indicated by the IT department, end of quote. Let us see what is the final outcome of this investigation. Okay, all right, MC, thanks very much for that time for a break now, but stay tuned. We'll be back in a jiffy with all of the other top stories. हर दिल बोले वाहवाड़ीलाल ये लड़की तेरा नाम क्या है पूछे वाले पूछे तो बता तेरी पहचान क्या है तेरा नाम गुजेगा तो उठेगा एक तूफान हिलेगी जमीन मचेगा घमासान तेरा नाम गुजेगा जब हर गली हर मकान देखेंगे फिर गेम तेरी ये है शुरुआत तेरी अब हर जुबान पे होगी बात तेरी देखिए पह 
Welcome back. You're still tuned into markets today. Let's get to the rest of the headlines that we're tracking for you. The fourth headline this evening, Mahindra CIE gained close to 3% after M&M sold 6.1% stake in the company to Society General in a block deal. Vivek Iyer is here with the details. Stock in focus is Mahindra CIE, now along expected lines. And as we reported yesterday, the Mahindra and Mahindra Group, you know, that uh, held a little over 9% stake in the company at the end of the December quarter. Yesterday sold almost 6.1% of the total equity, uh, changing hands at a little over 357 rupees a share. Now, this is along expected lines. Mahindra and Mahindra has already informed market participants uh, as well as the exchanges that they uh, would slowly be exiting from this particular venture. Um, the stock, in fact, uh, uh, after that particular announcement and also the announcement from the company that they would be exiting certain loss-making uh, businesses and loss-making entities actually saw a bit of a re-rating. However, given the fact that uh, Mahindra and Mahindra held a little over 9% stake and uh, right now they've exited 6.1% stake, what they decide to do with the remainder 3% stake continues to remain a bit of overhang as far as the stock price is concerned. The stock continues to remain in focus, especially given the large block deals that we are seeing in the entire auto ancillary space. All right, uh, Vivek, thanks very much for that. Staying with stocks and news, Sona BLW rallied 6%, post a steep correction. This is after the brokerage firm CLSA issued a buy rating on the stock, saying that the business thesis remained intact. Sonia is here with the details. Just to put it into context, yesterday Blackstone exited Sona BLW completely by selling their remainder stake for over 4,000 crores. Now that caused a little bit of jitters, right, as to why Blackstone is exiting Sona BLW and is that a concern in terms of what the way forward would look like. But uh, I did put out a piece where we mentioned that the business for Sona BLW is very strong and the growth outlook is pretty good. In fact, this morning as well, CLSA put out a note where they said that the stock's recent decline is due to some concerns over the continuity of the management post Blackstone's exit. However, Blackstone's exit has not changed their thesis. So just to put the numbers into perspective, it's been a very strong business. As of Q3, the quarter gone by, the company reported its highest ever revenue EBITDA as well as profitability. And the margins are also likely to increase going forward, says CLSA, because of a better product mix. Now, if you look at it, the financials over the last five years have been very strong for Sona BLW. It's been a 34% compounded growth rate on the revenues for the last five years. The EBITDA has seen a very strong growth as well. And now over 60% of the order book for Sona BLW, BLW comes from the electric vehicle space. So electrification is the big theme both globally and locally and Sona BLW is a big beneficiary of that. Hence after Blackstone's exit there was a little bit of a downtick but now the stock has recovered in a, you know, uh, considerably from its lows yesterday. Back to you. Okay, all right, Sonia, thanks very much for that. On to the fifth headline this evening. Then oil prices continue to slip after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank rattled equity markets globally. This sparked fears of a fresh financial crisis. Manisha Gupta is here with the details. Well, yes, the crude prices have fallen from the highs. We almost did $87 a barrel on the higher side. And from those kind of levels, we did see a break below $80 a barrel too. So for the week, we have seen 4% of a decline. And for the year 2023, we are down by nearly 7% now. At these current levels, the crude prices are trading at a three-month lows. While there is support uh, from the decline in US dollar and the fact that China demand could still come back, uh, EIA for one says that the Chinese demand in this year will hit record. Highs. But at this point in time, it really is about risk aversion. Markets are following macros, the kind of sell-off that we've seen in the global equity markets and, and the fact that uh, the, the, the Chinese demand is still uneven, even fragile. The U.S. bank crisis, the contagion fears and the concerns about recession, all of that seems to be weighing on to the crude oil prices. So much so that the market now feels that for the very near term, you could be looking at the crude oil prices uh, falling all the way up to 78 to even $76 per barrel. The second half of this year, is expected to see some strength. The markets will also keep an eye on the US uh, CPI numbers or the inflation data and further direction would come in from that. Okay, all right, Manisha, thanks very much for that. Uh, but in fact, stay with us because prices of precious metals are shining. Gold, silver, platinum, platinum prices have gained over 5%. Take us through the risk off that we're seeing, uh, which is a gain for a lot of these precious metals. 
Oh yes, this is a week that has seen a decline for the metal prices also. Hasn't been able to hold firm even as the dollar index is trading at a seven-week lows. Here as well, there are concerns about Chinese demand coming in. The markets now are, while anticipating that it would only be a 25 basis point rate hike from uh, the U.S. Fed, but much would depend upon on how we see the inflation data. The demand uh, from U.S. and Europe is expected to see a bit of a decline. The supplies are now coming back into the markets. There's also some restocking happening into the international markets, and even as the second quarter of the year is majorly peak demand season. The markets do want to uh, get out of the volatility, uh, get the events done with before you see some buying coming in. Until then, the expectation is that metals like aluminum and zinc, which have declined anywhere between 4 to 6 percent in last one week, could be under pressure. Copper, even with all that is happening, is 1.5 percent on the higher side for this week. So copper, steel, iron ore, these metals are doing well. The other metals slightly under the weather. Okay, all right, Manisha, thanks very much for that. On that note, it's also a wrap on this edition of Markets Today. Thanks very much for watching.